am so honored to speak at a conference with so many of my heroes present. I only wish it were live so I could tell them how much I admire them in person. I played Little League Baseball throughout my entire childhood and never made the All-Star team, but making this team makes up for it. Before I get started with this lecture, I'd like to say that I believe in evidence-based medicine, and so I'm going to put a footnoted transcript of the lecture with a full bibliography of the studies used and also links to the videos I'm recommending. You'll be able to find this at u-turn.us forward slash PCOS, and I'll put a slide of that up. I've been a physician for 36 years, but for the first 26 of those years, I played for the other team. I was an advocate of low-fat, high-carb, calorie-restricted diets, and eating five times a day. Then, in 2010, I discovered ketogenic diets and intermittent fasting both of which have completely changed my life, as shown by the slides you are seeing in the background. I was totally burned out after 60 years of battling the obesity and metabolic diseases that my sugar addiction had caused. But with a ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting, I lost 125 pounds and felt like I had lost 20 years off my calendar age. I had always dreamed of being a full-time academic physician when I retired from the Army, as I loved to teach. So in 2019, fueled by ketones and fatty acids, I came out of six years of retirement when I wandered the country in an RV and on a motorcycle and took a full-time position as the Associate Director of a Family Medicine Residency with 24 great residents all of whom have been open to incorporating low carb into their practices at some level after seeing it work in their patients. The book that changed my life was Gary Taub's Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It. I personally chose the primarily carnivorous path, but in the online low carb program I run at my clinic, u-turn.us, I support whatever level of carnivory a person chooses. Also, it is fully bilingual in both English and Spanish and not hidden behind a paywall. So feel free to give it a look and use it as a tool if it's helpful in your practice. When I started teaching the residents and putting the U-turn program together, I began to run into a lot of cases of polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS. As I dug into the literature, it quickly became apparent that it was just a way some women with certain genetic inheritances express insulin resistance. We began seeing success stories treating it with low carbohydrate diets like our U-turn program. So just what is polycystic ovarian syndrome? The current official definition is a woman who has two of the following three characteristics androgenicity, which means they have evidence of high levels of male hormone, and ovulation, which means that the follicles on their ovaries do not fully develop and release an ova. Women with anovulation usually have infrequent, irregular, and skipped menstrual periods. The final characteristic is polycystic ovaries. The only way to know if a woman has polycystic ovaries is to do an ultrasound or an MRI and see multiple small ovarian cysts in an enlarged ovary. Interestingly, this type of ovary is also found in women without any symptoms of PCOS. But I'll have more to say about that later. Here's what women with androgenicity look like. They have male pattern hair loss caused by the high testosterone levels, acanthosis nigricans, which is a darkening of the skin seen most commonly in women with darkly pigmented skin. It is usually first seen as pigmented bands over the finger joints and is commonly found around the neck, in the armpits, and over the breasts. And finally, excessive hair is seen on the face, arms, and legs in a masculine pattern. I couldn't find a picture of what not having periods look like, but this is what a 
polycystic ovary looks like when compared to a normal ovary. PCOS is the most common endocrine disorder in reproductive age women. There are currently about 75 million women in the U.S. actively menstruating and thus at risk for PCOS. 5 to 20 percent of them are estimated to suffer from PCOS. That's 3.75 million to 15 million women. In my supervision of the residents, I often see 40 to 50 patients a day, and it's a rare week when I don't see two to three women that I suspect of having PCOS. PCOS is an ancient condition. Here's what Hippocrates had to say about it. But these women whose menstruation is less than three days are as meager, are robust, with a healthy complexion and a masculine appearance, yet they are not concerned about bearing children and they do not become pregnant. In 1935, two surgeons, Irving Stein and Michael Leventhal, developed an operation for women with large ovaries with many cysts where they cut a wedge out of the ovaries, making them smaller which dramatically increased the ability of these women to get pregnant. Right up to 1982, when I entered medical school, what we now call polycystic ovarian syndrome was called Stein-Leventhal syndrome. The breakthrough that really allowed us to understand PCOS came in 1959, when two researchers, Solomon Burson and Rosalind Yallo, developed the radioimmunoassay. To perform this kind of assay, a radioactive element, usually iodine-125, is attached to an antibody against the substance you are trying to measure. A complicated process of mixing labeled and unlabeled antibodies with the patient's serum makes it possible to measure tiny amounts of a substance very accurately. One of the first things they measured was insulin, and they were shocked to find, among other things, that the level of insulin in people with adult-onset diabetes, which represents 95% of all diabetics, was not lower absent, as had been previously thought, but instead was much higher, often 10 times higher than in healthy subjects. Dr. Yallo went on to receive the Nobel Prize for this work. Dr. Burson unfortunately passed away in 1972, five years before the prize was awarded in 1977, and the Nobel Prize is not awarded posthumously. Dr. Yallo was just the second woman to receive the Nobel Prize after Marie Curie, and I think it's interesting that radioactive iodine played a large part in the work of both of these amazing women. On my blog page, borntoeatmeat.com, I describe myself as a knight errant in the battle against diabetes. My quest is to encourage treatment of insulin resistance as early as possible before its many pathologic manifestations like PCOS arise. And I have listed 39 of them on my blog page, but the giants are cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. A fellow Don Quixote who shared this quest was Dr. Joseph Kraft, a pathologist who noted the strong link between diabetes and heart disease. He set out to find a way to diagnose diabetes at its earliest stage, which he called diabetes in situ. Using the insulin radioimmunoassay developed by doctors Burson and Yallo, who by the way were husband and wife, Dr. Kraft found a way to do this. The gold standard for diagnosing diabetes up to that time had been the oral glucose tolerance test, which had been standardized in 1925. He developed a five-hour oral glucose tolerance test that measured insulin instead of glucose and did over 15,000 of them, many of which he was able to correlate with autopsy data. The test became known as the Kraft assay. In insulin-resistant people with a positive Kraft assay, the sugars often remain normal over the five hours, but the insulin resistance will cause the body to release higher than normal amounts of insulin 
in response to the glucose challenge to maintain the blood sugar in the normal range. He found that evidence of coronary artery disease was almost never seen in autopsies of people with a negative craft assay, but was seen in almost all patients with a positive assay. Unfortunately, Dr. Kraft died in 2017, but two other knight errants of low carb, Eva Cummins, the fat emperor, and Jeffrey Gerber, the Denver diet doctor, did an in-depth interview with him on the subject. You can find a link to it at u-turn.com forward slash PCOS. Everything changed with PCOS in 1980 when Dr. Bergen published a paper noting that women with PCOS had higher insulin levels on an oral glucose challenge test than similar controls. This sparked the research into the insulin PCOS connection. There is a research tool on the web called the Web of Science that allows you to graphically display, among other things, how the number of scientific articles mentioning various topics has changed from year to year. And you can see from the graph I generated using this tool how dramatically the research into insulin and PCOS has increased. If you look at the literature, you will see estimates that 30 to 40 percent of women with PCOS are not insulin resistant. I personally think there is good evidence that if there are women with PCOS who are not insulin resistant, that number would be dramatically lower or non-existent if the Kraft assay were used to determine insulin resistance. The Kraft assay, however, takes five hours and is frankly not very practical in a busy clinic like mine. I use something called the homeostatic model assay or HOMA IR in my clinic to screen for insulin resistance. This can be calculated by simply drawing a fasting glucose and a fasting insulin. The test looks at how much insulin is required to keep the blood glucose at a given level in a patient when their blood glucose level has not been affected by a recent meal. The formula for HOMA IR is the insulin value multiplied by the glucose value, then divided by 405. The 405 conversion factor was arrived at by taking a normal fasting insulin level and multiplying it by a normal fasting glucose level, then determining what the conversion factor would need to be to get a ratio of 1. Thus, a normal HOMA IR is 1.0. The gold standard accepted by most researchers to determine insulin resistance is the euglycemic clamp. But this requires a patient to be in a hospital with an IV line in place while frequent blood samples are drawn and is only done in research centers. The home IR has been extensively tested and correlates very well with the euglycemic clamp. In a large study by Dr. Catherine Delgarte in 2005, she looked at 251 women with PCOS and 260 women with normal periods and no evidence of high testosterone levels. She found that when the HOMA IR of the women with PCOS was compared to the HOMA IR of the controls, only 64% of the women with PCOS had insulin resistance. But when you look at her data, the average HOMA IR for her controls was 2.4. Thus, her controls were also insulin resistant with fasting insulin levels that averaged 10.4 or at least twice that of a non-insulin resistant person. The average home IR of the controls in Dr. Diogarte's study was very close to the level of 2.5 that was found at the point that provided the maximum sensitivity and specificity in diagnosing metabolic syndrome in both genders as per ATP3 and IDF criteria in another study. This highly suggests that Dr. Diogarte's controls were themselves insulin resistant and that the number of her PCOS patients who were insulin resistant was almost certainly much greater than she proposed. So how can high insulin levels cause the three pillars of PCOS, masculinization, failure to ovulate, and large ovaries filled with small follicles.
I could talk for several hours about the research on these issues, but here I only have time to cover a few of the highlights. Cells in the ovary of all women produce testosterone. In some women with PCOS, insulin has been found to cause increased secretion of testosterone by the ovaries. The normal way that the body regulates testosterone levels that are too high is to produce something called sex hormone binding globulin in the liver. Sex hormone binding globulin binds and inactivates excessive testosterone. High insulin levels decrease the production of sex hormone binding globulin in the liver and thus active testosterone levels go up. As to what causes enlarged follicle filled ovaries that fail to ovulate, there is fair evidence of an inherited defect of the insulin-like growth factor regulating system, where in the presence of high levels of insulin, the production of insulin-like growth factor binding protein decreases, leading to a hormonal cascade that results in the decreased local production of follicle-stimulating hormone. This in turn causes the follicle to never mature or produce an ova but to remain a small follicle in a state of arrested development. And finally, some women seem to have a gene that predisposes them to have enlarged follicle-filled ovaries that in the presence of high insulin or testosterone will fail to ovulate. In fact, in one study, women who had reported no menstrual problems were given an ultrasound. 20% of them were found to have polycystic ovaries. So why would a genetic defect that leads to PCOS not be bred out as it can cause 30% or greater decrease in fertility among women. Here's my theory. Since stable isotope studies clearly indicate that prior to the agricultural revolution, for most of our history, humans were clearly top chain predators eating a diet composed of mainly fatty meat. It is highly likely that during times of scarcity, humans turned to lower quality plant-based foods which were higher in carbohydrate and lower in fat. The higher insulin levels generated by this kind of diet would have triggered the decreased fertility and masculinization of women with PCOS genes. During this time of scarcity, their fertility would have slowed down, lowering the caloric need of the band and freeing those women to help with food collection. Then, when fatty meat again became available, they would become fertile. This could clearly have offered a survival advantage. We'll talk about the treatment of PCOS with low-carb diets in a moment, but first I'd like to talk about the effects of PCOS on the children of women with their condition and on the women themselves. Women with PCOS have decreased fertility, but they can still get pregnant. When they do, they are at much higher risk than a woman without PCOS for a number of conditions, including miscarriage, gestational diabetes, and pregnancy-induced hypertensive disorder. But there are also risks for the unborn child. Much higher blood levels of testosterone, insulin, and glucose are found in women with PCOS during pregnancy. Not only can they have direct hormonal effects on the fetal organs, but they can cause semi-permanent changes to fetal DNA gene expression through the process of methylation. This is known as an epigenetic change. Dr. Noor al Hada Mimuni, in a series of elegant experiments, identified methylation targets in both mouse and human DNA that could cause the PCOS phenotype of the mother to be passed to their daughters. This idea is supported by the fact that daughters of women with PCOS have five times the risk of developing PCOS themselves as the daughters of mothers without PCOS. And it's not just the daughters who are affected. The sons of women with PCOS exhibit higher body weights from early infancy, and insulin resistance develops with greater frequency as they grow older, and they are also at greater risk of developing diabetes. So how do we treat PCOS and prevent these problems? The most effective treatment is weight loss. Calorie restriction will lead to temporary weight loss with decreased insulin resistance and improved PCOS symptoms. But more than 90% of women who try losing weight with calorie restriction regain all the weight, usually with interest, after one year. 
I'm going to leave a link to my resonant talk, Obesity the Lecture, at u-turn.com forward slash PCOS. This lecture reviews all the major weight loss trials done in the last 50 years and makes this point quite well. If you're here at this conference, you probably already know the power of a low-carb ketogenic diet for weight loss. The advantage of the ketogenic diet is that it is sustainable over the long term and lowers insulin resistance and insulin levels just as effectively as calorie restriction without lowering the metabolic rate like calorie restricted diets do. Another dietary intervention that could help control PCOS is to avoid polyunsaturated seed oils like soybean, canola, corn, and peanut oil. There was actually a study done in Ireland at the Meath and St. James hospitals in Dublin. They found 104 women with PCOS. Half of them were given 2.4 grams of fish oil daily for six weeks. The other half received olive oil as placebo. They then underwent a six week washout period followed by six weeks of taking the opposite oil from what they had been given initially. Fish oil supplementation significantly lowered plasma bioavailable testosterone concentrations and was associated with a less atherogenic lipid profile. The lower the plasma omega-6 to omega-3 ratio got, the lower the bioavailable testosterone level went. Interestingly, in the same study, they collected cow ovaries from the local slaughterhouse and exposed them to either omega-3 or omega-6 to look for the production of androstenedione, a testosterone precursor. Omega-3 had no effect, but the omega-6 oil increased androstenedione production significantly. In an ideal world, we would cure all women with PCOS by placing them on a low-carbohydrate diet and their compliance would be perfect. I, however, face the reality every day that many people would rather have a shorter life with more disease than give up their addiction to alcohol, tobacco, wheat, highly palatable processed foods, or sugar. Thus, there comes a point when we have to turn to drugs and other therapies. There is a drug that is sold over the counter without a prescription that in one controlled trial was more effective than metformin, the traditional first-line therapy for PCOS. It's called berberine. I generally give my patients a gram of berberine twice daily. You can buy a two-month supply from Walmart for $10. Since PCOS is a disease of insulin resistance, all of the insulin sensitizing medicines are probably beneficial as they lower insulin levels and insulin resistance. I could only find studies for three of them, metformin, rosiglitazone, and exenatide. In one study with metformin, 39 of 43 amenorrheic women resumed menstruation. Though I'm not a fan of statin cholesterol lowering medications, there was a study that showed metformin plus the statin simvastatin lowered total testosterone and the luteinizing hormone to follicle stimulating hormone ratio better than metformin alone. Rosiglitazone, in one study, when combined with metformin, increased the rate of pregnancies, but it also caused weight gain, so it's not recommended for obese patients. In another 12-week study, rosiglitazone was shown to lower insulin resistance and increase sex hormone binding globulin, thus lowering testosterone. It also increased the ovulation rate. Exenatide whose commercial name is Bietta, was the first GLP-1 agonist on the market and was discovered in the venom of the poisonous lizard, the Gila monster. This class of drugs is very effective for lowering insulin resistance and has also been shown to significantly lower cardiovascular risk and cause dramatic weight loss in the obese. In one study that I found, the combination of exenatide and metformin was superior to either medication alone. Combination estrogen and progestin birth control pills are often prescribed to women with androgenization as they 
lower testosterone by raising sex hormone binding globulin levels. I could only find one study on using exercise as a treatment. In it, eight women completed a 16-week course of aerobic exercise training. They had a statistically significant improvement in insulin sensitivity and a statistically significant decrease in the total number of follicles measured by MRI. A promising new alternative therapy is called heat therapy. In one study, 16 women with PCOS were recruited. Eight of them received 30 half-hour hot tub treatments over an eight to 10 week period. During the treatments, they sat in a hot tub with the water heated to 40 degrees Celsius, 104 degrees Fahrenheit. The controls just had the pre and post test blood work. The subjects who completed the therapy showed statistically significant decreases in insulin resistance and significantly lower testosterone levels, while no changes in these parameters were seen in the control group. The theory on how this works is that sitting in a hot tub stresses the body in a similar manner to exercise. The same heat shock proteins seen after exercise are seen in the blood. It seems to have the same beneficial effect as exercise without the exercise. A subject of current interest is COVID-19. It is well known that people who are insulin resistant are more susceptible to COVID-19. In February, the Royal College of Surgeons in Dublin published a study that looked at the records of 21,000 women with PCOS along with 78,000 age-matched controls. The women with PCOS, after adjusting for many confounding variables, were still found to have a 28% increased risk of contracting COVID-19. Finally, I want to share a study done by an entity that might put human researchers out of business. Watson at IBM. He's already beaten the two best Jeopardy competitors of all time in a live televised game. IBM has a database called the Thomson Reuters Market Scan Commercial Database that contains over 3 billion medical insurance claims. Watson examined the records of women aged 18 to 45 years old for evidence of hyperandrogenism, ovulatory dysfunction, and the presence of polycystic ovaries. In that population, he came up with a prevalence for PCOS of 1.5%. I think this is a rather low estimate, but the thing that worries me is when is Watson going to decide to go to medical school and come after my job? So let me recap the main points I wanted to make. PCOS is a natural adaptation that allows humans to decrease their birth rate during times of scarcity on the diet we evolved to eat. But these genetic adaptations produce toxic effects in the setting of a grain-based industrial diet. The symptoms can be reversed by initiation of a ketogenic diet. PCOS is driven by the high insulin levels seen in insulin resistance, and anything that lowers insulin levels and our insulin resistance will improve the symptoms. Thank you very much. Great talk from uh, from Paul. I mean, isn't it fascinating how with PCOS, I mean, we've known for years that insulin resistance was was the issue, and yet there's still a reluctance in the medical profession to to basically treat the insulin resistance as a as a first line treatment, or maybe they don't know how to treat insulin resistance. Well, it's either a question of ignorance or you know, lack of will. I don't know what it is. I, I'm with you on that, but absolutely, there's literally. Millions of females around the world with symptoms of insulin resistance, which are exacerbating polycystic ovarian syndrome, and mm. the nutritional treatment, which is low-carb and ketogenic diets, which can offer them so much benefit, is being ignored. Yeah, so effective. Um, while we're talking about insulin resistance, uh, Paul talked about measuring insulin resistance, and uh, he talked about the HOMA IR test. Um, is that something that you use? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I guess there's two ways we can look at measuring insulin resistance, and it really depends on how in-depth you want to do a blood test. 
Now, if you do a HOMA IR, it's basically based on a fasting glucose level and a fasting insulin level. And you absolutely always need to have the insulin before you can accurately interpret a glucose level. And this is obvious because if somebody has a normal glucose level, but they're requiring levels of insulin that's coming out through their left nostril, then you know there's a problem. And if you don't do the insulin test at the same time, you won't know. So this is what we'd call pre-pre-diabetes. So I guess the terminology of pre-diabetes is where we have when your sugar level exceeds a certain threshold. But what happens when the sugar level is within that realm, but the insulin levels are starting to creep up? And if you don't do the insulin, you miss out on detecting the pre-pre-diabetes, which can pick it up, you know, 10 years longer before you actually end up with overt signs of diabetes. But if you're wanting to do an even better test, it's what we call the the Kraft test, named after the now deceased Joseph Kraft. And this is based on the premise that if you ingest glucose and either 75 grams or 100 grams of glucose, you can actually then monitor what happens to your blood glucose level over a period of time and your insulin level over a period of time. And he actually defined several curves that could actually categorize people based on their insulin resistance. Now, the original description was based on a five-hour glucose tolerance test with regular blood tests over a five-hour period. Most of my patients have lives, um, so we generally draw the line at two hours. But for my money, I think actually doing two-hour blood tests absolutely gives you enough information. And if we really want to drill down into what's happening with glucose and insulin, this is that's the way to go. It's really just like doing a normal glucose tolerance test that's been done forever by uh, by doctors, but it's adding in the insulin uh, uh, levels as well. And it always amazes me why serum insulin hasn't become a standard measurement. Uh, you know, we always talk about, you know, full blood examinations and blood glucose and so on. But, mm. no, I mean, you, you ask a doctor, oh, can you measure my serum insulin? They look as though, you know, look at you as if you're from another planet. And yet it tells you so much information uh, about what's going on metabolically. And, and when they do do it, they interpret it based on the reference interval, which for most of our labs here in Australia, they consider a level, a fasting level of insulin up to 20 to be totally normal. Whereas so what's your, what's your, people what's your like uh, Professor Bickman, myself, I, I think it, it should be five or under. Um, and frequently if I have elite athletes of, you know, people who are supremely metabolically healthy, we'll often see it as low as three or four. Really? Um, so I really think that, yeah, so when you do do it, you know, you have to look at what the science is and not necessarily go for the absolute uh, the reference range that they provide. And I guess one uh, little difference is it is like doing a glucose tolerance test, except you also have to do the blood tests at different times because we're actually looking to see when the insulin will peak at what point in the test. And so the sooner it peaks, the better in general. If you've got a delayed insulin peak, then that's a really, uh, a really strong predictor that your risk of developing overt diabetes in the next five years is significantly greater. So I always throw in a half an hour blood test as well because the more frequently we do the blood tests, then we just get more accurate temporal data based on where those peaks are occurring.